Welcome to this episode of Orthodontics in Summary. Today's podcast is looking at the clinical management of third permanent molars. It was a lecture given by Flavia Artis from this year's British Orthodontic Conference. Just to recap, the podcast is the opinion piece of myself and may not be 100% representative of the original lecture. It is independent work of myself and the Orthodontics and Summary team. So back to the lecture. Flavia started by asking that fundamental question, what do we do when we see an impacted third permanent molar? She then went on to divide her lecture into four parts, first looking at the guidelines which are present and the etiology, followed by looking at what are the factors that influence the eruption of third permanent molars and what do orthodontists do to influence that as a process. Then looking at what are the predictions from the literature and finally how good are we as orthodontists and surgeons at predicting the eruption of third permanent molars. So to start with he spoke about the difference in international guidelines. We look at the stricter guidelines from the UK for example from the NICE guidelines where it describes how surgical removal of third permanent molars should really be restricted to when there is evidence of pathology. That balance with the American Association with Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons. In their white paper from 2016, it describes much greyer indications for eruption, for extraction. Looking at non-functional third permanent molars with disease or high risk of developing disease. What are the mechanisms that result in impaction of third permanent molars? Well, partly it's to do with just the eruption pathway of them. Mandibular third permanent molars erupt measly and the rate of impaction is 25%, according to Worthington Systematic Review from 2016. When it comes to the mechanism of eruption, lots of things have been proposed, but in Fraser Bauer's landmark studies, she understood that actually it's a dental follicle which seems to pave the way for eruption of both third permanent molars and the rest of the dentition. Flavia then went on to describe a series of factors that influence the eruption of third permanent molars, that also includes root elongation, the vascular pressure which is present, and components of genetic control which we are not able to influence. But where the orthodontist does come in is in that key factor of space which he then went on to explore. Orthodontists have the capacity to do two things to space fundamentally. We can decrease the space or we can increase the pace, space for third permanent molars. We decrease it through end mass distalization or the use of elastics. Now what she's explored here is what are the potentials to dislice third permanent molars in the lower arch and there are limits to it according to Kim's 2014 paper and actually 35% of lower third permanent molars are already making contact with the lingual plate anatomically preventing further distalization from occurring. She went on to describe how through mesial movement and increasing space we also increase the rate of eruption of third permanent molars and that's an 80% eruption success rate if we carry out extractions of premolars and create space within the arch. That was Kim's 2003 paper. There were two words of caution that Flavia had when it came to creating space through extractions. The first was that if it's a crowded arch and we count extractions, it does not really influence the eruption of the third permanent molar as we're not creating space in the metromolar area. The second was that of the extraction of the second permanent molar. She mentioned Guru's paper from 1990, which suggested the extraction of the second molar does not help the spontaneous alignment of the third permanent molar. And Flavia's suggestion was, if there is an impaction associated with the second permanent molar, to consider the extraction of the third permanent molar and writing the second permanent molar. Otherwise, if we extract the second permanent molar, we have to wait some time for the continued development of the third permanent molar that for delays and complicates the orthodontic treatment. Can we predict what's going to happen with third permanent molars? Well, there's two main things that have been considered in the literature. The first is the mandibular morphology, and it follows that if the mandible is bigger, there's a greater chance of the eruption of third permanent molar. And that was in Bergtrub's paper from 2012. Retromolar space, can we measure how much space is available? Well, relatively simplistically, we can. Looking at an OPT, we can measure the space available in the retromolar site and measure the size of the crown. And if there is more than enough space, there's a good chance of eruption in 75% of cases. However, if we are short of space, then actually we can have 75% chance of an impaction taking place, according to Olive's paper. How good are we at making these decisions of prediction? There's a great study that Flavia was involved with 
where they took third permanent molars from OPTs and showed them to orthodontists and surgeons. Now, interestingly enough, in over a third of cases, orthodontists decided to extract those third permanent molars. More interestingly, surgeons in 50% of those cases decided to extract them, even though all of them successfully erupted in the nature of the study. Now, what this shows is that surgeons have other factors they're considering in their process, according to Flavia. They're looking at surgical morbidity, which is at 10% when it comes to damage to the ID nerve. They're looking at other forms of pathology, and actually third permanent molars are riddled with pathology. Even when they fully erupt into the mouth, 82% of them have some form of pathology, going down to 33% if they remain impacted within bone. Flavia spoke about if we choose to maintain and have surveillance of third permanent molars, there is no established guidelines or protocols to what is to take place. That's been looked at in Gardelweider's paper from 2021, which is a narrative review which suggested there are only two strong guidelines when it comes to third permanent molars. And we still need further recommendations on how to carry out surveillance with these impacted third permanent molars. In conclusion, it was a great lecture by Flavia. She looked at what the limited evidence is on third permanent molars, how orthodontists have a degree of influence over creating space, but also reducing space and potentially causing an impaction or increasing the likelihood of it. She spoke about the use of CBCT to help us diagnose what's going on with the third permanent molars. And working in a combined team, it's easy for an orthodontist to organise an extraction of a tooth, but actually it's the surgeons we should be asking for their input in that decision-making process. A quick update for me, I'm going to be offline for a couple of weeks as I'm moving house currently. As you can see with the empty space behind me, I look forward to seeing you guys again in a few weeks' time after the Simply Author meeting which is taking place in Dubai this year in the first week of November, which I shall be co-hosting my colleagues David and Ken. I'll see you guys in a couple of weeks.